All right, welcome everyone. And I see that we have uh, people from all over. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are going to start right now. Our webinar today is on building trauma-informed cultural orientation programs. And uh, to start, uh, again, my name is Manar Marouf. I am the Education Officer with CORE, and I am joined today by my colleague, Tiana Gonzalez, our Senior Community Orientation Officer. She will be managing the chat and answering any of the questions while we are doing the session. Let us start with our agenda today. As you uh, can see, this is a very big topic. And for today, we're only trying to scratch the surface of trauma and trauma-informed care and how that, how that relates to cultural orientation. So we are going to start by learning more about newcomer needs and their priorities. And then we are going to learn more about trauma. And uh, we are going to take a five minute break in the middle. And then we are going to continue with trauma-informed care and trauma-informed care principles and how we can incorporate that into cultural orientation. Before we start, and as usual, let's do a quick review of using Zoom meeting features for today's call. Uh, we have the audio uh, and then we have the chat. And, as, and I've seen uh, many of you have used the chat already. So I encourage you to continue using the chat if you, um, want, if you have any thoughts or comments during the session, because uh, there will be more, many opportunities for you to uh, participate. And then there's the Q&A section, which I highly recommend that if you have any questions to add them to the Q&A, because this will make it easy for me to see it at the end while uh, during the Q&A section so that I can answer all of your questions to the best of my ability. Great, so let us, let us start. Before we start, I just want to remind you that this webinar is being recorded. And that again, like I said, your participation matters. Um, and then uh, the recording and resources shared in this webinar will be shared with all of you uh, after the session. And to start, like I said, uh, I will share with you a story that might sound or look familiar to you. Please read and answer the questions afterwards. This is the story of Anna, who just arrived in, who arrived in New York City in December 2020 with her husband and two children from Ukraine. Before leaving her country, she used to work as a teacher and her husband was an engineer. While her husband speaks high English, uh, <coughs> sorry, high intermediate English, Anna is a low beginner and is eager to learn English. Thinking about Anna and her story, what do you think are the resettlement services that Anna is most interested in? Please type your answer in the chat. She needs English classes, financial assistance, safety, yes, employment, housing, tutoring, children's education, immigration assistance, child care, exactly, and benefits, immigration, therapy, cultural orientation, yes, thank you, Luda. Yes, um, family mental health, exactly. As you can see, there is a suite of services that uh, Anna is interested in and uh, the resettlement agency will be able to help with. Okay, so now let's see where Anna is three months later after, after, she, after she arrived. So three months after arrival, Anna started working at a restaurant preparing food. The other day, she was late for work because she got off at the wrong st subway stop again. Her manager was upset and gave her a warning. Her, ch her children are enrolled in school but are, are having a hard time making friends. She's afraid they are withdrawing and keeping to themselves. She also started having terrible headaches but her doctor said it could be due to lack of sleep. 
She just enrolled in English classes at the, at the local library, but she feels she's unable to juggle work, family, and learning English all at the same time. Now thinking this is the 90 day mark, which is the self-sufficiency uh, um, period for new newcomers. What do you think at this stage that Anna needs or what are her needs? Also, please take a moment um, to think about this case. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with similar cases and uh, let us know in the chat. Luda, can you spell BH for us, please? Uh, she needs social support, healthcare, mental health care, career, life coaching. She needs a community. She needs friends. Yeah. Community support, transportation help and assistance, school support, therapy for her and her children, support group. Perfect. Community integration, yes, behavioral health, I, I thought so. Uh, a family mentor, friends, yeah. So as you can see, even after three months of being in the United States, Anna still has a lot of needs. And um, for us as service providers to understand, to better understand newcomer needs, it, um, it would be, um, I thought it would be a good idea to look at that through a framework called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Um, in this hierarchy, which is um, a pyramid, Maslow, who, uh, who as a psychologist, categorizes human beings' needs by levels to understand what motivates them to behave in a certain way. And if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, you will find the last two levels are basic needs that are tied, very closely tied to safety and security. And these needs include food, having food, being able to uh, sleep, warmth, water, but also finding housing, finding a job. So these are very important needs for everybody and especially newcomers. And then when we go a little bit higher in this pyramid, psycho there will be uh, psychological needs like feeling that they belong, having friends, having relationships, uh, feeling that uh, some, the, the person is accomplished, they have accomplished their goals. And then when you go up like to the top of the pyramid, they, these are the self-fulfillment needs which um, concern achieving one's full potential, feeling that you have the agency and control of your life. So thinking at um, our clients are like newcomers and, and thinking about their needs, if you look at that, it gives us a perspective on how we uh, approach providing those services. But before we move on talking, I would like to mention that according to Maslow, these needs are hierarchical and they and one level needs to be fulfilled before the other. Whereas in reality, that is not completely true because many needs can coexist, can compete. And we see this a lot with our clients competing needs in the beginning. And, um, the, and they, this depends on each case and every person. So um, it, it is, so what happens after looking at this, what happens when people's basic needs are not met. When we know that when we feel that we need safety and security, we feel very stressed, right? And when that happens, uh, the stress levels increase, but our motivation, our newcomer's motivation to focus on other things decreases. And we see this a lot in our work as service providers we want to make sure that we provide services to new newcomers. We want to make sure that we, um, we enroll them in English classes, uh, provide cultural orientation classes, uh, send them to job interviews, and like help them with, em with employment, housing, etc. And but then when the client feels that their basic needs exactly 
uh, like what they need, for instance, for housing and employment are not being met, they will be highly unlikely to do other things that we ask them to do, like, for instance, going to English classes. And it has happened to me when I used to be in direct service multiple times where I would spend like days trying to find classes for uh, one client and they say they would show they would go to the classes only to discover that uh, they stopped going or like you would call somebody to come to a cultural orientation classes and they say they will come and you call again the day before and you call the day call again the day of and they still don't show up um, and that is um, that could be very frustrating to us as service providers because of the amount of work that we put into uh, into uh, be providing these services, but also knowing how important these services are for their integration. But at the same time, it is very important to understand that when somebody, when a newcomer does not show up or when they don't do that, it's not just it's not because they are disrespectful disrespect, uh, for our time or services. It's just there is so much going on. And unless they see the value and importance of the services that we're asking them to uh, to to attend or like um, do, they will they might not show up for those services. And, and this idea ties very closely with CORE's concept of the whole office approach. Because as you know, with CORE, we, uh, we encourage resettlement uh, you know, services or resettlement organizations to, uh, to adopt the whole office approach to cultural orientation, which means integrating cultural orientation in multiple services. And what that does, it helps um, uh, you know, clients understand the importance of each service, but also helps you as a service provider to tweak and adapt your services based on people's needs. Because like you have, you might have somebody who needs a lot of support and somebody um, who uh, does not, like they need the basic services and they're good to go after afterwards. So that helps, this idea helps understanding the different uh, needs um, and then specifically Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it provides a framework for us as service providers to look at or approach resettlement, um, the resettlement journey uh, in a holistic and humanistic way. Great. Now that we know about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I'm sure many of you already know about that, um, let's, and motivations, of, because it is very tied to, very much tied to motivations. Um, let's learn more about trauma. Okay, so according to the American Psychological Association, trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, rape, or natural disaster. Immediately after the event, shock and denial are typical. Longer term reactions include unpredictable emotions, sorry, flashbacks, strained relationships, and even physical symptoms like headaches or nausea. So, and looking, taking this definition and looking at our, uh, the experience of newcomers that we work with, uh, a lot of, or many of the newcomers went through traumatic experiences like having to leave your home country, uh, searching for safety, fleeing, fleeing uh, your country because of violence, uh, leaving everybody behind. These are all very traumatic experiences. And a lot of the times people think that by coming to America, a lot of their problems will go away and that they are going to finally be settled and everything will be fine. But with this expectation of being not, not realistic or unrealistic, a lot of the times this causes a shock to people and um, because they might have a hard time finding housing, finding a job they want, etc. So that creates something called resettlement trauma. And, um, the, and this stress, and if we look at Maslow's uh, pyramid and Anna's story, it puts a lot of what we're talking about uh, into perspective, specifically the resettlement journey in general. And now you tell me, so what's the different, what's the relationship between trauma and CEO? Why are we, why are we talking about trauma uh, in CEO? Um, and my answer is that one, one main thing to take into consideration is that trauma manifests in the body, mind, and behavior. 
And we will look at how that looks like for people who experience trauma. Okay, so the signs of trauma here, as you can see on the table in front of you, uh, there are uh, signs that you can show in the body, including a headache, muscle tension or pain, chest pain, fatigue, stomach upset, and sleep problems. And I don't know if it happened with you before, a lot of the times, uh, and it happened to me multiple times when a client would be, oh, I have a headache um, and, I, and I don't know why, why it is happening. I can't sleep. Uh, we find that a lot of the times as well with the employment team when clients say, oh, I can't do this type of job because I have like muscle pain or back pain or chest pain. And sometimes it's not caused by, um, a, by like a reason, that the unknown reason. Sometimes it, keep, it could be caused by stress. Um, the other way trauma shows is in someone's mood. And that includes having anxiety, restlessness, lack of motivation or focus. And this is very important for us because cultural or in, in cultural orientation will provide a lot of new information uh, to, to, to people. So when someone is experiencing trauma or has experienced trauma, uh, they will have a hard time focusing because uh, it is known that chronic stress affects memory, the memory centers in the brain and subsequently affects someone's ability to, um, to retain information, focus, or learn, learn new information. And that leads to somebody feeling over, like overwhelmed, uh, feeling upset, irritated, um, and uneasy all the time. And sometimes it can lead to sadness or depression. Um, when we talk about uh, behavior, sometimes trauma shows in somebody not um, not eating well uh, or eating too much. Uh, uh, sometimes it can affect uh, uh, drug or alcohol use. Um, sometimes uh, people smoke uh, cause it can manifest in social social withdrawal. Somebody doesn't want to be with people. They don't want to socialize. And and we saw that in Anna's. They, um, she felt that they were, they were withdrawing from the school environment. And definitely uh, trauma affects our ability to take care of ourselves or like um, to it includes exercising and uh, being healthy. So as you can see, these are all signs that can show when we work with somebody or when we talk with somebody. So it is important to pay attention to these signs and uh, look for them in cultural uh, orientation. Because like I said, it affects someone's ability to be, to focus and be there and, um, and, and, and their ability to, um, yes, somebody said, does trauma cause high blood pressure? I mean, I'm not a doctor, but from what I read, yes. Uh, because of stress and the release of cortis cortisol in the, in the bloodstream and other, and other factors. Now we're going to talk about trauma-informed care and the trauma-informed care principles. Trauma-informed care, mean, care means that we implement a sensitive approach that takes into consideration people, people's trauma, exper experience trauma into our services. And uh, this will help a lot not just for our clients' learning and participation in engagement during cultural orientation, but also their overall well-being and experience with us. So, and it, and it can be words we say, things we do, gestures, actions, behaviors, and we will see more of that shortly. So what are trauma-informed care principles? There are four, and we are going to start with the first one, which is about safety. And safety means creating a welcoming environment where clients feel psychologically and physically safe. For instance, during cultural orientation, you can try to have signs in their language, or you can learn how to say um, hello in their language, because for clients, 
being in this new environment can feel intimidating and having something that looks familiar to them uh, shows, gives them a, a sign or a message that this place cares about them. The other thing that we want to do is to avoid triggering them. And uh, trigger, trigger is anything that could remind somebody of a negative experience that they had in the past that could elicit certain reactions in them. And uh, a trigger could be a smell that reminds somebody of someone or something. It could be a word, it could be an anniversary, it could be a story or anything like that. So um, we want to avoid that. In cultural orientation, and that could also get, that could look like avoiding asking certain questions uh, that might trigger people to having to, to bring them back to negative experiences. Uh, like, for instance, asking them, uh, "Why did you leave your country?" or "How did you leave your country?" or "Where is your family?" And especially if these questions are not related to the services that we're offering, they could be, have a really bad effect and bring somebody to feel very upset and irritated because it reminds them of negative experiences or negative memories from the past. Uh, and when that happens, we want to de-escalate. And uh, de-escalation techniques, we talked about them during our last webinar on uh, cultural humility and awareness with Afghan arrivals. And you can find that on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, and that those, those, the, these techniques involve saying certain things like, oh, I'm really sorry that you feel that way. Or um, I can't imagine what you went through or what you had to go through or certain things like that to bring the situation back to a calm state and bring the, the lesson back to, um, to, to what you to, to, the, to the topic at hand. The other, the other principle that um, we are going to talk about is transparency and trust, trustworthiness. A lot of the times, clients do not have a clear understanding of staff roles and responsibilities, and they will ask questions um, outside of uh, the scope of cultural orientations, for instance. Um, so, and this could also be caused by stress, someone feeling very uncertain, very um, feeling unsafe, and sometimes our brains function in a way that we want to find answers, and then we see somebody uh, working at this resettlement agency and we think that, oh my God, they can help me. So a lot of the times uh, they, they, they might come to you for questions that are not related to cultural orientation. So in that situation, it's very important to set clear expectations of who you are, what your role is, and what you are going to, uh, what service you are going to provide. And at the same time, it is very important to share and be honest about what you can't do. You can say, I'm going to teach you about housing in the United States, but I'm not going to help you find housing in the United States. There is the housing specialist who can work with you on that. The, the reason why you want to do that is because you want to set to manage those expectations. And then in that case, the participant knows that this is not the right place to talk about housing, uh, how, where I can find housing, but it's a place where I can learn about housing in the United States. So they will focus with you and they will be more engaged. The last, uh, sorry, the third principle is empower, empowerment and collaboration. The way resettlement services are established in the United States can sometimes create a feeling of power imbalance between newcomers and service providers. Um, the kind of relationship feels like you come here, I tell you what you need to do because I know what's better for you and you should do what I tell you. And I know it's, it's purely coming from a place of helping but, and, and we have, like as service providers, uh, we have so many cases, we have so many things that we need to do, and we want to make sure that we provide those services effectively, so it becomes sort of automatic. So in order to off offset this type of relationship, it's important to work together with the client, and this means sometimes asking them, uh, first of all, do not lecture, do not 
you know, use our lecture style where you're talking and they're listening or nodding because that's not going to be helpful in, in, for so many reasons. And then um, you can ask them about what they want to learn about, um, ask them about uh, their learning style. Uh, how do they how do they learn? Are they visual learners? Do they prefer discussions? Do they prefer uh, to, to listen to, uh, to a podcast, etc.? And then um, you can also ask them, which of these topics are important uh, to you? What do you want to learn first? So these are very small like changes and small questions that can make a huge difference into this experience for, for, for you and for the participant. And then the last principle is choice. And from thinking about Anna and the clients that we work with, it sometimes feels like the client's life or the newcomer's life in the first 90 days that they do not have a choice or say in what they need to do. And that affects someone's self-esteem and um, the way they, they view themselves. And it is, that's why it is very important to incorporate certain strategies during CO to help them feel like they have a say. And it could be something as small as asking them, um, do, you, do you want to take a break? When do you want to take a break? And then also thinking about safety. It encompasses all of the above principles because, uh, sorry, choice. Because choice, if you have a choice, you feel safe, you, hear, you can trust others, and you can feel that you are empowered in the decisions that you make. So it is important to take these into consideration while we are working, um, uh, while del planning and delivering cultural orientation, working with newcomers. And uh, to test that, we are going to do a scenario, actually two scenarios. Um, and then uh, what I would like you to do after we read the scenario um, or, we, uh, or listen to the scenario, take two more minutes to think about the scenario, the questions that are, are at the end of the scenario, and please feel free to share your answers in the chat. Okay, scenario one, you're delivering the housing lesson. Participants seem to be very interested. And to engage them, you start asking about their housing situations in their home country. You ask, tell me what was your house like? Did you rent or own? One participant starts talking for five minutes and tells you how his house was destroyed in an airstrike and that he had nothing left. Suddenly, the whole atmosphere changes in the classroom and participants feel visibly distressed. Um, the first question is, how should you approach teaching this topic differently? And then the second question, how would you apply trauma-informed care principles here? And take your time. You can share your answers in the chat. And I see the first response.
maybe acknowledge and validate that their living experience uh, or living situation back home is faint, is painful. So it's not dismissed. Yes, we do not. We definitely want to acknowledge and validate. We do not uh, pretend that this didn't happen. Don't revisit the past, but ask them what their needs are now. Yes, that's very good. Um, Samuel, what will like your house to what, what will you like your house to look like exactly think about the future and think about what you have at the moment um take to recognize trauma informed care principles in practice yes exactly i would ask permission first ask them if they feel comfortable talking about, about their past home if that information is even needed yes cynthia it's we want we want to take uh, to ask for their permission because they don't feel like they're obliged to talk to us about something that they don't feel comfortable with. Um, I would avoid asking about past events about the client's life if I was to pretend to present this training differently. But if I did ask a question like this, I would say it looks like this question brought up some painful memories. I'm sorry, what do you need to feel safe right now? I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as asking this question, but the other way you approached it is really good because um, in this, in this um, setting, we won't be able to solve like the problem and we don't want to take the, um, the time away from the session. We can say, let's take a break and maybe talk to the client separately and see if they want um, like more support. Uh, start welcoming them and explain American housing, concentrate on today and the future. Uh, exactly what aspects of your house would make you feel most comfortable? Yes. Avoid trigger, focus on educating them on how housing works in the United States. Exactly. We want to give them the knowledge so that they can feel empowered to make decisions. And I know that a lot of the times um, this can be very difficult because these are very sensitive topics. Housing is very is tied very closely to our sense of safety and stability. And if we don't have stable housing, it can affect every aspect of our life. So um, the way we approach this conversation is very important to make them feel reassured, but also be very honest and clear that you might not find your dream house or your dream apartment here, and it might take some time and etc. So it is important to provide that space for people to share, but also um, be honest and uh, and and um, and set and manage expectations. Um, and that surprise, you can ask. I like Jennifer's um, comment. Yes, instead, uh, if there were any features in your home here that surprised you, yeah. Uh, focus on what excites them uh, to 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 engage with you now, and like I said, this topic is very sensitive and it is a triggering conversation. Um, and then, like all of you mentioned, the questions that you ask are very important. Like, what would you like to have in your house? What's important in your apartment? Uh, because we we have to teach these topics, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we're not triggering. All right, moving on to the second scenario. Okay, you're delivering the employment lesson. You tell participants they have to take the first job they can find. Someone asks you to give examples of job, jobs newcomers usually find. You share that many jobs will be in the hospitality industry. One participant becomes irritated and yells, this is not acceptable. I used to be a doctor in my home country, and I refuse to take any jobs like that. Like, again, please take a couple of moments to think about why the client was irritated and how would you handle this situation?
All right, I see some answers in the chat. Um, Molly said, I would be irritated too if I'd been a doctor and had to switch to a job I didn't like. The client probably expected to continue their past job right away and is forced to change their expectations. Exactly. Um, Madison, yes, you're right. Acknowledge and validate their feelings. This that it is hard, a hard transition to have to go through. Um, yeah. Listen and be validating that they are, they remind them that they are starting over in life and your job is to show support in helping them and adjust and acclimate to a new home. Yes, um, sharing experiences, being transparent about resettlement benefits and timelines, offering career coaching. Amazing, yes. Um, there is so much unfairness in his situation. It's not fair that he had to leave his country, that he can't practice in his profession anymore. So I would validate him in a gentle way and explain that this is just a first job, not a permanent definite. Yes, not a permanent uh, definition of who he is. Yes. Discuss with participants about some of the requirements and possibilities of getting job, leave the discussion open and encourage them to keep trying. Yes, wonderful. Just in the interest of time, um, uh, I want, I do, I, yes, I want to acknowledge what you all shared. It, all your answers um, were correct and on point. And um, this, uh, the client is triggered because of his self-esteem needs uh, that are not being met. Because a lot of the times we tie our self-esteem to our, to our jobs. And when uh, that does not, um, when, when we don't, when we are unable to uh, satisfy this feeling, we feel devalued, unappreciated, and this creates feelings of um, resentment, anger, and upset. So, um, but it is important to cover th those topics, knowing that they are going to bring up some negative feelings and negative emotions and reactions. Um, and just as much as possible, explain to the client exactly that, um, it is, it is a, a temporary job, it is a start, and that explain to them what it, what it would take for somebody to practice certain, like for instance, for his, for his situation, he's a doctor, but like for other situations where you don't need to recertify, but you need to speak English. So explain to them the process of what it takes to uh, build this credibility in the United States as somebody who's not from the United States uh, coming here. So you want to speak good English, you want to have work experience in the United States, you want, you want to know how, how uh, what the work culture is in all of these skills. So what helps is uh, maybe connect them with the, with the education team so that they can help them with their education goals. Um, um, you know, if, for instance, uh, like I, I just I just heard today of a client that I used to work with from Afghanistan who um, wanted to go to grad school so bad, but in the beginning it was not easy because he has uh, a family and he has a lot of responsibilities. So we worked on a long term goal for him to go to grad school. And he he, graduated, he literally graduated yesterday. So it, it, is, it is a long process. Acknowledge these situations and also acknowledge that it might take time and bring examples. If you can bring examples of people who, who were able uh, uh, to uh, move beyond the first job and start rebuilding their lives slowly but surely in the United States. I know we are, uh, we only have 13 minutes left. And I really want to make sure that we uh, answer some of the questions in the Q&A and um, the post um, and talk about the post survey. So I'm going to start with James's question, can cultural orientation process in themselves contribute to a trauma? More so with the kind of information that are given to migrants when they fail to meet the expectations and realities of migrants it becomes a problem. Hence, information should be tailored to meet migrants' expectations and realities. Exactly. Uh, we A lot of the conversations that we cover during cultural orientation are tied to people's sense of safety and security. And it's very important to approach 
these conversations with uh, sensitivity. Like I said earlier, we don't want to ask questions um, that could be triggering. And that's the key word here. We want to avoid triggering as much as possible. And if that happens, and I'm not saying it's like, it will not happen even if you do trauma, if you employ trauma-informed care principles, because they might still happen, uh, to know how to de-escalate and use these simple techniques of validating and uh, reassuring somebody that that will be very helpful uh, for, for you and to make sure that the class runs well and that you cover the, the topics that you want to cover, but also make sure that participants feel safe and engaged. All right, um, the second question from anonymous attendee um, on avoiding triggers. How do we balance avoiding triggering questions with activating background knowledge, acknowledging and acknowledging their past? For example, a lot of my volunteers like to introduce themselves by showing pictures of their families and asking about their families. Should we avoid that? I mean, do you? depends on how much information you know how much you know about the case already um if you if you know um that in their past there was not some that there was no family loss during to due, due to like the war or like coming here etc maybe that that's good but there are also other ways that you can um that you know the volunteers can ask about they can ask about uh, favorite sports, favorite foods, uh, and showing pictures of that, um, mutual interests, different interests, different uh, uh, norms and traditions, that will help them learn more about each other and learn about who, what they want and learn about their goals. Um, question from Dania, please provide more examples that differentiate principles three and four, seems like principle three, empowerment and collaboration, includes the idea that we need to hear our, our, to hear our clients and offer them a choice in guiding their lessons and programming. Can you provide more details on principle four choice and how it is distinguished from empowerment and collaboration? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dania. That's a very good question. Like I said earlier, choice like the choice principle encompasses and supports all four. Because like I said uh, earlier, sometimes it, it, it is disempowering being a newcomer where you led maybe led a success, a very successful life and your circumstances changed and you had to go to a new country and learn everything from scratch and depend on others. As, especially as an adult, we, we get a lot of our, a lot of our self esteem from being able to lead our lives without help sometimes, and then when that happens, it it makes people feel disempowered, and to continue with, uh, and then when they come to us for services and they feel like they have to do all of these things that we tell them to do without asking them what they need that can be uh, very disempowering, um, especially if they have like a like a like a strong sense of pride um, in, them, in themselves and then in their accomplishments. So um, to give them a choice, choice is like I said earlier, do you want to take a break? Do you want to learn about this? Do you want to, um, like, what do you want to learn about? How do you, um, when do you want us to, to, to do cultural orientation? You're right, they're very similar. And the difference is that like the key is empowerment and how it ties and how having a choice can make someone feels empowered. Thank you. Um, from an anonymous attendee, I understand about the importance of avoiding triggering instances. We avoided this in our program, yet in many of our classes, students themselves brought up the topics of how they escaped, how the Taliban is currently searching their houses, what the Taliban is doing to girls' education. So how do we make this a positive experience. Um, you mean the experience of being inside, like, you know, being in cultural orientation? Because no matter how you flip it, it's not a positive experience, right? And, um, and I know that there is so much that we can talk about during cultural orientation. If you want, um, if you want to have a session uh, and to acknowledge those feelings, 
And uh, so because a lot of the times people provide this support to like participants provide the support to each other. And, and, I, and I shared an example earlier um, in an earlier session, and I'm going to share it again here. Um, I, when, I remember when I used to deliver cultural orientation in the past, uh, I was um, we had a session in, um, in Spanish and uh, with a Spanish interpreter and one of the participants had zero interest in being in the classroom no matter no matter how hard i tried to engage her she didn't want to be there she um i would ask her questions she would answer she would either not answer or say yes or no and that's it and then um because she she clearly didn't want to be here and then we we and i and i i wanted to do something about it because i didn't want to let it go um i knew there was more to this apathy and, and you know um, desire for not to, to not be here. So we started talking, especially during cultural adjustment, we talked we started talking about belonging and um, how it feels like and like the specifically the honeymoon phase. And she's like, I have not experienced the honeymoon phase. I feel terrible. I don't want to be I don't want to be in this country. And I felt so bad for her because at the same I, I felt bad for other participants because they had to hear that. But at the same time, I, I felt very, very, I felt for her, this is somebody who led a successful life in their, in her home country. And then she had to, to be in like, you know, to come here as a single mother and take care of her child and learn everything without speaking English. So a lot, what we did was like, we started talking about that experience. I, I, I definitely acknowledged her feelings and emotions and the other participants started talking about, because we were like, they were very engaged and laughing and joking the whole time. But then suddenly they started sharing how hard it is for them to be here, to, to be here sometimes and their challenges. So that conversation created a, a safe space for everybody to share who they are and not feel judged or devalued. And then like, it was like magic. This participant uh, started feeling engaged. She started participating. She started laughing and joking. And, and, and the, 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 the session ended because we were all from different places. Uh, we were able to connect on that level and, and acknowledge how hard it is for us. And, and I'm only bringing this example because it, sometimes we think that we need to provide, um, like we need to like find a specialist and do like all of these big things that we might not be able to do or have the resources to do. But sometimes it takes acknowledging someone's uh, like uh, pain and seeing them and like allowing them the space to be to be uh, and share who they are, sometimes that can be very helpful. But I would also, for your situation, uh, because the trauma is very recent and it's real and it's happening, it's happening as we talk sometimes for, for some of their family members, um, I would consult with a social worker on your team uh, or the caseworker and see if it's better to provide counseling, uh, support, um, a safe space, for participants to share um, or like just uh, conversations because sometimes when you say counseling or mental health support it can be off-putting and people feel discouraged and they don't want to do it but if you frame it in a certain in a different way space to gather space to uh, be together and especially for afghans uh, you can provide tea uh, and nuts or like that's just a space for them to be and talk and sometimes that can be very helpful and empowering. All right, I don't see any other questions, but I also, I wanna make sure we only have three minutes left and I wanna make sure uh, to spend some time of uh, completing the webinar survey because you're, like I said earlier, your participation is always important and matters. And uh, your, um, when you complete the survey, you tell us uh, you give us ideas on, on how to improve. And also uh, there is a question in the survey uh, that asks if you want to learn more about this topic, what would you like to learn more about? So I would really appreciate if you take the time now before you leave to uh, complete the post webinar survey. Thank you all again for joining us today. I hope that this training 
was uh, helpful and uh, we see you in, we will see you in another core training sometime soon.